Um, thanks for joining this webinar this morning. I begin today by acknowledging the Yagamba people, traditional custodians of the land on which I am based today. My name is Stacey Vogel. Online today helping me um, with the logistics of the webinar is Andrew uh, McKay, Company Info's Regional Extension Officer, and he's based in St George in Queensland. Um, I just getting a bit of an apology. I have a cold, which is impacting my voice, but you won't be hearing too much from me today, so hopefully it won't be too much of an issue. So today we have online from the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, Michael Hutchison, Andrew Norris and Jenny Schaal, who are presenting the findings from their CODC funded research, which looked at impacts and solutions of irrigation um, infrastructure on fish health, which include the development of a prioritisation framework and a review of some of the mitigation options available. This research forms part of a program, program of work that CODC has been investing in and an out, as an outcome from the 2019 CRDC and Griffith University Fish Stewardship R&D Pilot Workshop. The workshop held in Brisbane with representatives from the industry, universities, state and federal government organisations identified a number of knowledge gaps, including two priority areas investment for the Australian cotton industry. The first was a risk assessment to understand impacts from different types and locations of irrigation infrastructure on fish ecology. And the second was around an, invest, an assessment of the environmental and economic impacts of fish entrainment diversion technologies such as fish screens. <coughs> Excuse me. This morning we'll be hearing about the research outcomes from the first of uh, that risk assessment undertaken by CUDA. And the second priority area of research is being addressed in a new three-year research project led by New South Wales TPI and funded by CODC and the Fisheries RDC. Um, this new research will evaluate the economic and environmental return on, the, on um, investment of fish screens. And as part of the project, they will develop case studies that will assess the economic productivity impacts of um, screens, such as costs, water use, efficiency, pump performance, maintenance and labour costs. I'm now going to hand over to Michael Hodgson from QDAF um, team, who will spend the next half hour giving us an overview of their research and what they found. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Okay, so our, our research team on this project was myself, um, David Nixon, who's currently on lead, uh, Jenny Shaw and Andrew Norris, and we did a, a lot of our work in the Emerald and um, Comet area. So the objectives of our study were to compare the relative impact of different pumped infrastructure types, um, also to compare entrainment rates of fish um, during pumping events on natural flows and allocated flows. Um, the natural flows we split up to flows that stayed within the riverbanks and sort of flood flows that were over the bank. Um, we also looked at entrainment rates of fish in diversion channels um, coming off Fairburn Dam. And we also investigated the susceptibility of different fish species and different size classes to entrainment. Not all fish are equal. Some, some are far more susceptible to being entrained than others. Um, this is all working to, towards developing best practice guidelines and prioritising the types of infrastructure that are in the most need of mitigation. And we also provide an overview of the range of mitigation options available. Um, following a literature review. So the background of this project, the work was done in the Fitzroy River Basin near Emerald and Comet. And I'd like to thank the um, various properties that led us on, on to um, do this study. Um, the reason we chose the Fitzroy River Basin is because it contains a mix of species that are typical of northern tropical rivers and also fairly typical of the Murray-Darling Basin. So we thought it was a, a good good system to work in because the findings may be more broadly applicable. Um, so the project, as I mentioned before, there were two components. There was a field component where we looked at the entrainment of fish through the irrigation infrastructure. And then there was a literature review where we looked at all the different mitigation technologies that are currently available and the studies that have been done on those. And that review is should be available on the CRDC website. 
So our sampling methods were fairly simple. We had a custom made net that we could set across an irrigation outlet. Um, it would have captured almost everything that came through the outlet. It was normally set around 10 to 15 metres downstream. Um, as well as that, we also set a larval drift net near the outlet. Um, and we could record um, with a flow meter the volume of water that was passing through that larval net. Um, we also had a pretty good idea of the volume of water flowing through the large net as well by looking at the pump flow meters or speaking to the landholder and what their pumping rates were. As well as sampling the irrigation outlets, we also sampled the adjacent river or adjacent impoundment habitats to look at what fish fauna were in the river and compared that with what was actually coming through the pumps. So in the river, we looked at three basic types of pump intakes. Um, the pump intake at A is what we would call a mid-river channel intake. It normally extended several metres from the banks, sometimes in the narrower channels, almost to the, the middle of the channel. Um, the second type, what, what we called um, bank side intakes, they either were flush with the bank or they only protruded like 50 centimetres or less than a metre out from the, the river bank. And the third type at sea is where there's an excavated short channel perpendicular to the river and the pump intake sits at the end of that. Um, there was also some variation in depth. Um, on an allocated flow or a typical base flow, if the top of the intake sat less than a metre below the surface, we called it a shallow intake. If on a similar sort of flow it was sitting more than a metre, we called it a deep intake. Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a throat problem, I'll just have a quick drink. On Fairburn Dam, we looked at two diversion channels. There's the Selmar channel. While we were looking at that, it was all pumped. Um, it wasn't gravity fed because the dam levels were too low for a gravity feed. And we also looked at the Weimar channel, which was entirely gravity fed and um, the intake is approximately at the end of that arrow there. So you can see there's a range of pumping intake types that we looked at with different pumping rates. And we have to opportunistically sample allocated flows and natural flows that came along. You can see that for some of the pump sites, we've got variable pumping rates. That's because with different river depths, you can get different um, head on, on the intake, so that can vary the um, amount of water coming through. But also some pumps were twin pumps. So on some flows, particularly allocated flows, they may have only been running one of the twin pumps, but on the natural flow events, they may have been running both twin pumps simultaneously. Um, the pump on uh, the Selmar channel, I think, is a variable speed drive, so they can vary the, the pumping rate. So we analysed various factors that could influence entrainment rates using generalised linear models. Those factors included the abundance of fish in the adjacent river, uh, the pumping rate, um, the intake position and depth, and also water temperature. Um, we compared the size distribution of the fish in each intake with the size distribution in the adjacent reference site to get some indication of vulnerability. We also compared the catch per megalitre coming through the outlet with a standard catch rate in the adjacent reference site. And that gave us um, 
what we called a susceptibility index, which basically indicated whether fish were highly susceptible or not particularly susceptible to being pumped. And for the larvae, we compared the catch per megalitre in the outlet um, that we caught in our larval net with the catch per megalitre that we were catching in the adjacent reference site in the larval net. And the ratio of those two gave us a susceptibility index. So to summarise the amounts of fish coming through, it ranged from less than one per hour up to 476 fish per hour coming through the riverine pumps. And the average across all of the pumps in terms of fish per megalitre was almost 29 fish per megalitre. As far as larval fish went, we had a range of zero to 2,878 per meg coming through, or which equated from zero to over 42,000 larvae per day. Um, larval stuff was highly variable because if fish hadn't spawned recently, you'd get nothing, but if there'd been a recent spawning event, you could get quite high spikes coming through. The pump diversion on Fairburn Dam um, had a range of 34 to 154 fish coming through per hour. Um, on a per megalitre basis, the average was about nine fish per megalitre. But the um, gravity fed diversion had much higher rates coming through and the average um, per megalitre was almost 197, which is a lot higher than any of the other um, our intakes that we looked at. In terms of larvae, there wasn't much difference between the pumped or gravity fed diversion on the Fairburn Dam. Um, so first factor that we looked at in detail was pumping rate. On a Per unit time basis, as pumping rate increases, the number of fish coming through per unit time increases. That was a trend across most species of fish. There's a few examples put up there, just so you can see the repeated patterns. But there were a couple of exceptions. Generally larger fish, the plot was a lot flatter. And it was very flat for spangled perch. In the terms of most of the larger fish, I think that's because they're not particularly susceptible to coming through. But with spangled perch, we actually think they were actively swimming in through the, the pump intakes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So they're choosing to go in rather than getting sucked out of the river. If you look at it on a per megalitre basis rather than a per unit time basis, there's still a upward trend, but it tends to taper off with increasing pump size. It flattens. So it's more of an asymptotic curve. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Our intake position. From left to right in each of these graphs, we've got bankside deep intakes, bankside shallow intakes, mid river channel deep intakes, and the side channel shallow intakes. The consistent pattern across all of these is that the bankside shallow intakes seem to entrain less fish. And there are a lot of other species that followed the same pattern. The only exception to this that we found really was rainbow fish, which seem to be more susceptible through the bankside shallow intakes, but just about everything else, um, the bankside shallow intake normally had lower entrainment rates than the other intakes, to the extent that the largest river bank pump that we um, sampled had um, lower entrainment rates than a lot of other smaller pumps nearby with different intake configurations. Influence of flow type. Um, 
from left to right, they're allocated flows, natural within bank flows or flood flows. So the overbank or flood flows typically had the lowest entrainment rates. And that was pretty consistent, um, not just in terms of uh, individual fish, but also the numbers of species entrained as well. And the same was for the previous one, the um, bankside shallow intakes also entrained less species than the, the other intake types. As far as larval fish go, um, golden perch larvae were only entrained on natural flow events that we observed. Um, we didn't capture any on allocated flow events. Um, so they're more vulnerable on the natural flow events. Probably they're more likely to be spawning on those um, natural flow events. The other thing with most larvae was that they were more prevalent in the warmer months of the year. Um, some species such as carp gudgeons and bony brim, you'd catch the larvae coming through on both natural and allocated flows. Um, in the, possibly at slightly higher rate on the um, allocated flows, but generally there wasn't much difference. As far as the Fairburn Dam diversions go, um, the red line shows the gravity fed diversion and the green line at the lower part of this plot shows entrainment rates through the pump diversion. You can see that the um, gravity fed diversion has consistently higher entrainment rates than the pump diversion. But interestingly, there's not a positive relationship here between um, the, the pumping rate or the rate of flow coming through. Um, there are other factors influencing the entrainment rate, such as the temperature in the dam and the abundance of fish in the adjacent reference site. And, and there were some seasonal effects there too. With more replication, we could tease that out more, but I guess the take home message from this one is that the gravity fed seems to entrain more fish than the um, pump diversion. With fish larvae though, um, the pumped or gravity fed flow rate per day definitely had a positive effect on the um, number of fish larvae entrained. And although it wasn't significant, there was still a tendency for the gravity fed um, diversion to entrain more larvae than the pump diversion. So as I mentioned before, one of the things we looked at was the susceptibility of different species and size classes of fish to being entrained through diversions. Generally, we found that the large bodied adult fish that we captured in the river, such as Saratoga, um, golden perch or yellow belly, Murray cod, um, they weren't coming through. Um, but in the gravity fed Weimar channel in particular, we were sometimes getting some larger fish like um, golden perch, um, leathery grunter, which is pretty equivalent to a silver perch in the Murray-Darling Basin and some catfish species coming through. In the riverside pumps, we occasionally got some medium sized catfish and um, adult spangled perch, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So generally, it was the smaller end of the scale that was coming through the, the pumps. So the blue bars represent what was coming through the pumps. The other colour is what we found in the adjacent river. So you can see this example of bony brim at a particular site that the catch is biased towards the smaller end of the scale that's coming through the pumps. Carp gudgeons, they're a pretty small species anyway. Um, so the 
the fish coming through the pump pretty much reflected what was in the river. So again, that's smaller fish coming through the pump systems. There was an exception, however, which is spangled perch. I did mention before that we think that they actively swim into the pumps. So it was the larger size spangled perch that were tending to come through the pump systems more. And we think it's possibly that they're on a spawning migration and they may be looking to move laterally into wetlands. So they might be following um, currents that are running lateral to the main current of the river and thus ending up being entrained. So spangled perch were one exception. The other one that was a bit of an exception was olive perchlet. Now olive perchlet themselves are a pretty small fish. They don't get much bigger than about 80 or 90 mil. But compared to what was in the river, we were tending to get the bigger end of the scale coming through with the olive perchlets as well. And they're another fish that likes to move into wetlands for breeding. So in terms of what were the most susceptible species to entrainment coming through the pumps? Well, bony broom and carp gudgeons, we caught a lot of them coming through the pumps, but they were very common in the adjacent river. So they weren't the most susceptible, but they were one of the more common species coming through the pump. But in terms of the most susceptible, the two most susceptible species to entrainment that we found in the river were the olive perchlet and the spangled perch. So that's an olive perchlet there, and that's a spangled perch there. So we were getting them coming through at rates much higher than you would expect given their abundance in the river. And as I said before, we think they might be actively moving into the pump intakes. And in the Murray-Darling Basin, olive perchlet are considered a threatened species, at least in New South Wales and Victoria. So that, that's quite a significant finding. Um, in Fairburn Dam, the most susceptible species were different to what we found coming through the river. So spangled perch weren't that commonly entrained coming off Fairburn Dam, even though they were reasonably common in the, the dam itself. Um, we think that's possibly because Fairburn Dam being a static water body, they're not getting the same migration cues in the dam, so they're less likely to be entrained coming from there. So the most susceptible species being entrained out of Fairburn Dam through the diversion channels were carp gudgeons, flathead gudgeons, juvenile bony brim and juvenile golden perch. Um, the carp gudgeons and the um, golden perch, sorry, carp gudgeons and bony brim were also quite common in the dam, um, but the golden perch were coming through at a rate higher than you probably would have expected. But there was no significant difference in the susceptibility of larvae through any of the systems that we looked at, either those coming off Fairburn Dam or those coming off um, the riverine systems. So what can be done to minimise fish being entrained? Well, we looked at the literature at various types of barriers and screens that are available. Um, there's electric barriers, there's bubble, acoustic and strobe light barriers and various combinations and physical screens. Of all of these, the physical screens are the most effective the others are only partially effective or sometimes ineffective. And I believe that the electric barriers could make things potentially worse if they um, stun fish and they actually become more vulnerable to being entrained. Electric barriers are normally used to stop invasive fish moving upstream. So they're not a particularly good fit for preventing um, fish coming through a um, an irrigation system. OK, apologies for this, everybody. Um, so as Michael was mentioning, um, as part of the review, they identified a few different options um, that could be used to um, reduce or uh, even prevent fish entrainment. Um, 
through water offtakes. Um, the conclusion of the review was essentially that physical um, screens are the most effective. Um, and this is this is for a variety of reasons. Um, the modern, um, I guess, fish screens are made of a wedge wire. They're self-cleaning. They can pass large volumes of water and they actually can be very effective at um, preventing um, fish entrainment, but also stopping fish getting pinned against the screens, which can cause damage even if they don't end up passing through the pump. Um, these new um, new fish screens are also generally self-cleaned um, and they provide much better flow than traditional back, uh, trash racks, particularly in high debris um, scenarios, um, and there's no need to back flush them generally. So there's several main types. Uh, the first type is um the cone screen so this is um, better for low flow scenarios um it can handle high debris loads and fluctuating water levels um generally you've got self-cleaning brushes running around the outside um infrastructure involved with these ones can be substantial but they can be used to pass large volumes of water um, for smaller offtakes, the typical um, screens used are cylinder screens. Um, these can either be in a T-shape to double the volume or they can just be an end of pipe fitting. They are retractable and they are also self-cleaning, again made of wedge wire. Most of these uh, this style of screen actually rotates to help with the cleaning process. As, as, it, as it spins around, the brushes, um, I guess, uh, deflect the debris and that gets swept downstream. Again, very effective, um, but of note, this is a design that can easily be removed um, if you, for instance, need to remove your pump infrastructure during upcoming flow events or floods and so forth. The last style of screen is uh, generally used in gravity diversions and it's a vertical panel or a fixed plate. Uh, again, generally constructed of wedge wire, though some of them do use perforated plate. Um, they're generally used where you've got a sweeping velocity where you can um, have the water pass through the screen and all the debris gets swept downstream um, via a bypass channel. Similarly, the fish get um, swept um, past the screen, out of bypass channel, and back into the main um, waterway. A website's actually been set up in Australia called fishscreens.org.au. Um, there's a lot of information there on the different screen designs, um, and also has the contact details of some of the uh, manufacturers in Australia. Another thing that's been put in place is actually the Australian Fish Screening Advisory Panel. Um, this panel um, provides information towards that site and its purpose is to provide a coordinated approach to fish screening in Australia. So they can help answer any questions or um, concerns that, that people have. So this one here is just an example of a, um, a vertical panel on a gravity diversion. It's all well and good to know that um, fish are being entrained and it's a potential issue, but um, how do we best spend our money to mitigate these impacts? And uh, this is a big, big issue and a big concern where we've only got a small bucket of money to spend on, on uh, on solutions. So where should we spend our money? Um, at the moment, there are some subsidies available in Australia for uh, participating in um, screening trials. Um, there's a Northern Basin um, toolkit. Um, so there's in New South Wales, is being administered by New South Wales DPI, and um, they're looking for participants um, and volunteers to join in a study on the effectiveness of these screens, uh, particularly considering the, uh, I guess, the operator expenses and benefits. And in Queensland, the southern Queensland landscape um, are administering a um, demonstration program 
in Queensland waterways. Um, New South Wales also has a subsidy scheme, a state-run subsidy scheme in place as well, um, looking at encouraging uptake of screens. Now, as Michael mentioned, uh, it does appear that um, gravity diversions would actually need to be a high priority because of the rate that they take out um, fish compared to um, pump diversions. Um, but large screening, uh, screening large channels can actually be very expensive um, upfront, um, but deliver some uh, longer term benefits. Um, but having said that, the cost is generally um, spread over the number of large number of users participating in a irrigation scheme. So the individual, the cost per person actually goes down. Um, so using the results from the monitoring up around the Emerald region, we've actually developed a prioritisation system um, for river iron pumps. This is a really good starting point for where we should initially consider screening or what is the highest priority to minimise the impacts on fish populations. I guess the um, decision process has been developed as a matrix considering four different um, variables. The first of these is the type of, um, I guess, flow type that's pumped. So is it within bank, over bank and so forth? Um, this, did, as Michael suggested, had a um, bearing on the number of fish that are entrained. The other factors include intake position and depth, pump rate and um, annual pumping rate. Now, the way that this matrix works is that um, each pump is given a ranking in each of those categories um, based on what you see on the, on the screen at the moment. And then the scores from these are multiplied to um, give a, a pump priority value. So the higher the um, score, the higher the priority. And this will allow us to compare between uh, water offtakes within a catchment. However, at, when you're considering um, prioritising investments across catchments, a few other factors probably need to be considered, including, including the presence of threatened species or economically valuable species. Um, also, we need to consider um, other other variables that are, are very catchment specific. Um, with the matrix, when you're dealing with uh, variable pumping rates, so i.e. a twin pump that where the irrigator runs either one or both pumps, uh, depending on how much water is coming down the system, um, each pump needs to be um, treated independently. And then the scores can be combined to actually um, provide um, I guess a prioritisation value for that particular site. Now the other thing that hasn't been included in this model yet is um, feasibility. So as I mentioned before the cost of installing or uh, installing screens varies uh, between different infrastructure types and that needs to be in consideration um, when um, looking at prioritisation. The other thing is that it's not always as easy at some sites as it is at others to um, install stream, install screen. So it's not just a cost, it's potentially a feasibility as well. So that get, if, you, if you're starting to look at the broader scale, feasibility does need to be included in prioritisation mitigation. Now, um, in, in that sense, then it may actually be better off not spending an excessive amount of money on a hard to do project. Instead, better benefit might be achieved by screening several easier pumps of slightly lower priority. Um, but this would, this would provide a greater benefit for the same level of investment. So I guess the recommendations from this project are that um, Gravity diversions should be considered a high priority for uh, mitigation. Pump diversions can be prioritised using that four-part scoring system. Um, and as mentioned, um, consideration also needs to be given to feasibility and a range of other factors 
um, when you start looking at a broader uh, comparison. I guess one of the take-home messages is that um, future irrigation developments should actually consider installing screening at the design and construction phase where it's significantly cheaper than trying to retrofit and that would provide the best benefits. Further replication of the sampling that has been undertaken would actually provide more confidence uh, or higher level of confidence in the metrics um, for the flow type being pumped the intake location, depth and pump rate. Um, the trends are fantastic, um, but yeah, a little bit of further replication um, would be beneficial. And certainly further research needs to be conducted on the cost benefits of screening for irrigators in terms of um, operational efficiency gains or potential operational efficiency gains and ensuring that um, the conf you know that they can have confidence that screening won't have a significant impact on their financial position as stacy mentioned um, a three-year project um, currently um, starting or underway between new south wales dpi the cotton rdc and the fisheries rdc um so throughout this project uh, we've been uh, i guess communicating uh, with irrigators but one of the outputs has actually been a uh, there's a lit review looking at the i guess understanding and comparing the different options for um, retrofitting to pumps to actually um, reduce fish entrainment and then there's also going to be the final report which summarizes um, everything that we've been talking about now for the prioritization matrix there are actually lots of worked examples in the final report um, so it's very easy to follow through in a stepwise um, process and um, these reports should be available online by around the end of august i believe so that's the end of the presentation we'll just see if michael has rejoined us yeah i'm back Thank you, a very big thank you to the QDAP team, um, Michael, um, Andrew, particularly for <laughs> stepping in the last minute. Um, thanks very much for your time for the presentation today. Um, thank you to everyone for participating with your questions. And um, as you said, the, the information will be put up on the Info website um, and um, the QDAP team will actually be, or Michael will be at the Cotton Conference as well. So um, he'll be there for any of the growers and other people on, on line who might want to catch up in person with them. So thanks everybody and um, have a great day. Thank you and apologies for my internet dropout. <laughs> well, well done. Congratulations on the good study guys. Thank you.